Hello and welcome to December's Tech of the Months, the final Tech of the Months of the year. And I'm joined by a new face for the channel. Hello, Simon. This is Simon Smythe, the new senior tech writer here at Cycling Weekly. So, Simon, you'll be covering bits for the website and the magazine. And the magazine. And you might even pop yourself up on this YouTube channel a couple of times in the coming months as well. And here I am. Here Hello. he is. Hi, everybody. So welcome to the brown armchairs of Tech of the Month, Simon. But I'm gonna jump in first with my product this month, which is something a bit more modern and also very new at the time of filming. I have the Wahoo Element Rival Sports Watch or Multi Sports Watch. So it does lots of different smaller sports, but the main three are running, swimming and cycling. Um, and it has various fancy bits of tech built into it to allow you to do them as fluidly as possible. Yeah, um, I actually wrote the story on the web for the, uh, the launch of that and it's got something called touchless transition. Is that right? Yes, it does. Uh, and all triathletes will know there are various transitions in a race. This is meant to make them as smooth as possible. So you don't even need to touch the screen or start a new activity or begin a new sport. The watch can tell from your movements and where you are and your speed um, what type of sport you are doing. And it will seamlessly, it says, transition you from the swim to a run to a bike ride uh, without having to touch um, the screen, which is pretty cool. That's a very smart so bit of kit. Uh, so you put your, your Wahoo computer onto your bike and then once you, you finished your swim, you get onto your bike and then the data is there on the screen of your element Computer? Yes, that's wow. correct as well. So it has a yes, a, an additional part of that is this ability to transfer the data from your watch to your element computer, sort of like a um, second screen, mirroring screen the data. Mirroring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really smart because obviously cyclists don't tend to um, want to look at their wrists. Although one of the reasons we're not a triathlon um, brand here, Cycling Weekly is very much a road cycling brand. But we do get lots of questions from cyclists wanting to know uh, if they want to get a computer or something to track their rides, should they get a smartwatch or should they get a cycling computer? So there is a lot in smartwatches that is worth talking about in the context of cycling. Um, and this is also particularly interesting for those people that also like to swim and run at the same time. Sure. One of the reasons that the Wahoo Bolt became such a popular cycling computer is because of its ease of setup. Um, and that was kind of the major thing that Wahoo shook up when they released that cycling computer was that all is done through the app or the companion app on your phone and you can add things to the data screen via that app. And as you would expect, Wahoo have done the same thing for the watch. So it boasts a pretty simple setup process, which those of you who have maybe used other sports watches can kind of know that they all sort of have their different ways of being set up. Simon's wearing a Suntu This is a Suntu 5. Uh, I have a Garmin Phoenix, um, and there is no rhyme or reason to how you operate any of these watches, and they're all seemingly different to each other. So it's kind of cool that Wahoo have simplified that process on their phone, or on your phone, um, does make it easier to use. It has all of the built-in gubbins you'd expect from a modern uh, smartwatch. It's got a barometric altimeter. It's got optical heart rate as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it pretty much does everything, really. I think something that really impressed me, I just, uh, I just paired it with my phone last night, actually. And uh, you can even change the, uh, the watch face appearance on, your, on the app. Um, on the Sunto, you, you do a lot of things via the watch. Um, I thought that was quite interesting. That you Did you find that easy to do? Yeah, absolutely. I, I didn't even, I got halfway through the, the quick set up and then, uh, then I, I just knew how to operate it, every button, really easy. I guess it sort of does, a, it counts steps as well and does the other things that wearables do. It does, yeah, it does count steps. Decent battery life, they're claiming um, two weeks in standard watch mode, 24 hours if you're just using, or you're using the GPS to track an activity. Also retains, Wahoo's Perfect View, which uh, if you've used, have you used a Wahoo cycling I computer? haven't actually, no, no. So it has a really cool feature where uh, you scroll down and up and it increases the number of data fields available to you on the screen. So it's a way that you can really zero in on just the metrics that you want to have if you're training. Um, so they've carried that across to the watch as well. Um, and it also has Bluetooth Smart and ANT Plus, so you can pair it to power meters for cycling, heart rate monitors, um, even your kicker turbo trainer 
if you wanted to and it can control that through the watch so um, it is very smart and has a lot of the mod cons you'd expect from a modern day sports watch so that's the wahoo element rival sports watch which costs 349 pounds 99p and keep your eye out on the cycling weekly website for simon's views on it when he writes his review hello michelle Hello Rupert. Welcome to Tech of the Months. Now, what have you brought this month? This month, I have a helmet, as you can probably tell. This is Giro's new Helios Spherical. It is the second spherical helmet that it's produced. The first one was the Aether, which we gave a 10 out of 10 score on the website. So it's gonna take quite a bit of beating, right? Mm. But yes, spherical does not uh, specifically refer to the shape. It refers to this MIPS technology. So it's actually spherical MIPS tech. Uh, Giro worked with MIPS in their own lab to produce this. And it basically has the MIPS layer integrated. So rather than having the plastic layer inserted as a separate piece, it's actually a part of the helmet. So it is a two part system. The really fun thing is that you can kind of move it and, and actually watch it. Um, yeah, it's sort quite. Of it, it was quite a um, novel idea when it first launched back on the EFA, wasn't it? This idea that it can basically turn separate to the, the, the bit inside it, really, the shell inside. It's like two shells on top of each other. To put it really simply, uh, basically there are two layers here rather than you having that kind of inbuilt extra layer. And the reasons against having that extra layer were it wasn't quite so comfortable, it's not quite so good for cooling. And also some people said that the layer got stuck in there or the hair got stuck in the layer. Not a problem I've ever had, but Rupert tells me it is yeah, a problem. It happened all the time to me because that, that extra layer that Michelle's referring to is literally a plastic sheet bunged yeah. into the top of the helmet and I always used I used to be scared about taking my helmets off because I was scared it was going to pluck hairs off the top of my head knowing that way that like when you pluck one individual hair it really hurts so this is that appeals to me massively okay yeah and I can definitely see the point around comfort so this looks a lot more comfortable does feel a lot more comfortable so you've got the kind of padding here and you don't have that extra plastic sheet against your head which is which is pretty perfect so that's how that system works so there being two separate layers also means that they can be tailored to specific types of impact. So one is more tailored to high speed crashes and one is more tailored to low speed crashes. So we don't really like to think about crashing, but that is why you're wearing a helmet. Now it's a bit of a confusing lineup. Giro have been seemingly adding top end helmets for a while now. It started with the Thints and then the Aether and now this the Helios. Mm -hmm. But this is actually a bit below the Aether, but not by a huge amount. It is, it's actually really marginal. And that was one of my biggest questions for Giro is, well, okay, this, this new helmet seems pretty great. Why would I buy the Aether? Um, so the Aether is still the top end pro helmet. So the World Tour teams will wear the Aether. And that is actually because uh, though this has 15 vents and the Aether has 11, in the Aether they are uh, wider. So they're bigger channels um, and actually the cooling is said to be uh, around 2% more efficient. That's the kind of main differentiation in terms of why this helmet is not as good as the Aether, which is more expensive. They did test it in you know, different head positions, different yaw angles, and they did find that this was faster. And there is a price difference between the two of those as well, isn't there? The Aether and the Helios. This, yes, yeah, so the Helios is 229 and the Aether comes in at 269.99. So that is the Giro Helios Spherical. It comes in at 229. It has an awful lot of the properties that came in the Ether, which we awarded 10 out of 10, and um, which was more expensive. So we will be putting this through its paces in a long-term test, but I'm imagining with that in mind, it'll probably do quite well. I'd have thought so. Thanks very much, Michelle. All right, thank you. Now it's time for Bike of the Month, and seeing as it's Simon's first time here was as I thought I'd give them the little treat of bringing along something that he wanted to show off. So Simon, what have you brought along? Okay, so this is the, the TI Rally 40th anniversary replica. It is a replica of the bike that won the 1980 Tour de France with a Joop Zuttermelk. Um, 
it's not, and it's, I would say it's not. It's it's more of a, um, a tribute than a, than a replica. I mean, it, it's very difficult to do an exact replica of something 40 years ago, obviously. Um, but I think they've done an incredible job. What they've done is they recommissioned some new 753 tubing, which was the top tubing of the day, incredibly light, um, incredibly strong. So um, they made it incredibly thin. It's not made in Britain anymore. This one's made in Taiwan. The components, um, yeah, it, it was a, the original bike was all Campagnolo Super Record. Um, Super Record now is made of carbon and it's electronic. It, it wouldn't have looked very right. fancy pants now. <laughs> yes, it's Super yeah, Record. Yeah. So. It would have looked pretty crazy on this bike. So what they've done is they've found the closest, uh, the closest possible Campagnolo components. So that's a, a Veloce rear mech, um, which is rebadged with just the Campagnolo logo. The stem is a, a Cinelli 1A, the, the type that Eddie Merckx actually used. The hubs, they're, um, the, Campanelli, the original Campanelli Super Record hubs were the, the, the large flange hubs just like that. So, so they're, they're a pretty good approximation of them as well. The, um, the old Mavic logo is on the rims, which is a really nice touch. Yeah, I think, I think it looks really smart. That, going back to that rear mech, is that um, Veloce rear mech that is available nowadays or is yeah. it a um it's not a classic um it's it's a 10 speed one i mean this is a it's got a, this is a 10 speed bike now so um there's obviously a, a concession to the modernity <laughs> there <laughs> the um the, the, the brakes are modern as well and that's probably something that people will be will be thankful for yeah um <laughs> there are some things that could maybe stay in the 1980s and that's potentially yeah. the brakes yeah. so but so the, but the, the 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 bars and the uh, and the hoods are really um pretty authentic looking they've used actually cloth tape for the bar tape which is not going to be particularly comfortable but it's going to give you that retro experience which is what this bike is all yeah. about um the the seat post as well it's, it's the closest they could get to the to the Campagnolo seat post that um, Zota Milk would have used. Um, I, th I think most of all the paint, I mean, those, those colors, they, they really just say one thing, and you know, that is the, the TI Rally Team Professional. It's just such an iconic bike. I mean, maybe iconic is an overused word, but you know, Rally do say, you know, it, it, it's iconic, and it really is iconic. It's completely pristine. We haven't taken it out in this horrible weather yet. <laughs> Not um, yet. But, but I'm really looking forward to, to finding what it's like. Do you, have, what it's um, like. Do you have a weight for it? Uh, yes, it's, um, it, it's just under 10 kilos, which doesn't really sound very light. <laughs> Not by um, today's standards, and, uh, perhaps. And I think it's probably a bit heavier than Zotomelk's bike would have been as well. Mm. Um, Rally have had to um, make certain things a bit, a bit chunkier, really, just for, for the sake of safety, because safety standards have changed since 1980, and it, and it was a race bike, obviously. Um, this is meant to be ridden as an everyday, as a, as a Sunday club run bike, anybody can ride it. So they had to just really make sure that it does adhere to all the, the modern safety standards, sure. which, and, and which means it's got to be a bit chunkier. So I can see it's got some down tube shifters on it. Are you, you comfortable shifting like that, Simon? Uh, it, it takes a bit of practice. I mean, these are, these are friction shifters. They're not even indexed. So, um, so you've got to do it all by feel, basically. And it does take a little bit of practice. And, and I think I, I predict that with... Um, this modern 10 speed setup it's going to be a, a bit more difficult than with five or six speeds um, you've got so more errors to, that you can make i suppose <laughs> as far as sure the cassette that you can shift yeah yeah so uh, so that's going to be pretty interesting now you're no uh you're no stranger to um sort of classic bikes are you simon yeah. it's something of a um it's a passion of yours. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love steel bikes. I think the, the, the ride of steel, you know, the, the, the feel of steel is a bit of a cliche now, but I think, um, but I think really um, it, it, it's got a lovely ride quality. Obviously, people want to ride lighter bikes than steel now, but I think, I think for the ride quality, really, you're not really going to get much better than, a, uh, than, than the ride of a really, really nice steel bike. Sure, and you have a couple of... Um I don't really know what's the right word. Renovated? Um, They're not really houses, but yeah. Um, I mean, I have a I have a steel that my steel Colnago Master Olympic is is probably my favourite steel bike. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I have a. Uh, I mean, I, I like to ride a steel winter mudguard bike. But this is, you know, a beautiful setup that you've got going on here. And keep your eyes peeled for the new year when Simon is going to be doing some. Um, well, hopefully you're going to be doing up some sort of classic bikes for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got one with the, uh, with the sprayer at the moment, actually, an old Roberts, um, another famous Croydon mark. Well, not another, a, 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 famous, a famous Croydon brand. Um, and that should be back pretty soon. I'm going to be building that up and um, we'll see how I get on with that. So that's pretty, pretty exciting for us. 
Uh, now, before we move on, Simon, how much does a one of 250? Yeah, it? yeah. Okay, so 2,500 pounds uh, for the full bike, for the full build in that build just there, um, or 1,500 pounds for the frame only, frame and fork, that is. Sure, yeah. 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 Lovely. Well, thanks very much for bringing that along, Simon. I look forward to seeing you going flying by, desperately trying to unclip in, in your shoes with those cleats. But uh, it's, it's a lovely looking bike and very cool to have featured it here on Tech of the Month. So that's the TI Rally Replica, Simon's Bike of the Month. Thanks very much for bringing that along, Simon. It is pleasure. Yeah, it is something special. We don't often feature these types of things on Tech of the Month, so it's nice to have a bit of a change. Now, thank you very much for joining us uh, again for Tech of the Month, and thank you for joining us all this year. You know, it has been a really crazy year, and I think it's been really hard for everyone, and it's been an absolute pleasure to keep being able to bring everyone content throughout a year like this. And it's been really special to see the channel go from strength to strength. So thank you so much for all of your input, the comments, the likes, the subscriptions. It really does mean the world to us here at Cycling Weekly. Now, before the year ends, we do have one very special project still to come. It is the Cycling Weekly Awards, but this time, for the first time ever, they are going into the video format. So keep your eyes peeled for that coming soon to our YouTube channel, the website, and the Facebook and Twitter channels as well. Now we'll be back in the new year, January 2021, with some more products for Tech of the Month, and we hope you have a wonderful Christmas and a safe new year. We'll see you then.